right, so I'm going to talk about the mathematics of counting uh, a little bit. And specifically, <clears throat> I want to talk about the um, mathematics of counting combinations of things. And the reason that I want to do this is in part because I've been working on a project for about a year now that uses this as like uh, this kind of logic and this kind of math as its like fundamental value prop, but also um, because programmers are often concerned with how large, likely, or um, or slow things are. And counting combinations of things is an integral um, means of estimating these kinds of things. So now it's true that a lot of the counting that needs to be done as a programmer is pretty simple. But I think that <coughs> very often when people say that like you don't need to do a lot of math or to know a lot of math or I don't know who says you don't need to know a lot of counting techniques, but uh, those kinds of things about um, programming I think there's a little bit of a selection bias because people don't try to count things they don't know how to count. So this is hopefully an intro to some of you guys to uh, you know, learn how to count some things that are interesting or different. And I think the best way to intro new concepts, particularly math concepts, is with something simple. So rather than diving into a technical example and then spending a whole 15 minutes on how to like piece this new concept to something that's also kind of complicated, let's just use a metaphor that's very like fifth grade word problem kind of thing. So here's the metaphor. And I'll get to some examples of like, I'll, t I'll talk about like real world application at the end. Um, but here's the metaphor. So you're a teacher of a kindergarten class. You've picked out five animals. And you want the students to each uh, do projects on these animals based on how much they like each one. You're going to just have them do a project on their, their two favorite ones. And every student has a different preference about how much they like each of these animals. And you have every possible um, preference or like power ranking order of these five animals represented in your class. Uh, so you have like the maximum possible number of students because it's public school and you're totally over encumbered by <laughs> the system. So um, they're going to, instead of having all these students do their own thing, again, public school, you don't want to grade them all individually. You're going to have them group up by their top two favorite. It doesn't matter the order. And the question is, uh, how many things are you going to have to grade? How many groups are there going to be? And this question is synonymous with how many ways are there to choose two things out of five. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to start by doing it with a graph. And then we're going to talk about the pitfalls of why this, why this method sucks. Um, and then do it better. So anyway, let's start with the graph. Uh, we're going to represent each group with an edge between these five nodes. So each edge has you know, two animals that it goes between. So let's count the, these things. We've got all the groups with aardvark are here. And then without double counting, we've got three more groups for blue whale. Again, two more for cat, one more for dog. By the time we get to elephant, all four groups that it's in are accounted for. So we don't add any more. And then we have we've got our 10 groups. And this seance, we're in a lot of trouble, but things that people get away with in public school. Um, so. Uh, this is great. So we've got an intuition of what these things are that we're trying to count a little bit, at least graphically speaking. Um, but clearly, this is like not very good. If we had just had them choose their top three, now we've got overlapping lines. It's going to get messy. If we had 100 animals for them to choose from, we're never going to finish the graph. So we've got to come up with a better way to do this. Um, and without a graph, uh, I would say the first step, like many coding problems, is to define the question very precisely. So I think everyone in this room knows uh, it's very easy to sit down with a problem and just like throw spaghetti at the wall and get nowhere with it. So it's better, particularly in this case, um, and in a lot of counting cases, to really think about like what is it that you're trying to count and what, what is the problem, like redefining the problem that you have in ha at hand. So this is our problem. How many groups will there be? But we want to come up with a more generalized method of solving. And uh, I'm going to propose that it's easier to get the two numbers on the right than it is the, directly the one on the left. The number of groups is a little bit more convoluted of question and answer than these other two. And we've all used the logic here before. We've said, well, if I want to know how many like groups of things I'm going to make, if I just knew the total number of things and I knew the size of the groups that I was making, I just divide. So that's what we're going to do. And we know the number of students is every rank is the number of rank orders of five things. It's 120. It's five factorial. But the group size is 
uh, another question entirely, which is how many favorite rankings choose the same two animals? Now, this question is a lot easier to solve and is really the key to unlocking the answer to the first question we've got. Uh, sorry, I keep pointing at a screen because I'm not a professional here. Um, to answer this first question, right, we can answer the second question and get that ratio. So, let's answer that second question there. Uh, we've got this. So let's let's just try to count. None of the groups are special, by the way. I, th I think that's that's clear that there's a symmetry between all the groups, and that we don't. We just need to count the size of one group to know the size of any of the groups. Um, there's nothing special about any particular pair of animals. So let's look at the aardvark blue whale group, the eclectic group. Um, we've got this like kind of moot permutation here, which is you know this weirdo decided that. Aardvarks and blue whales are substantially better than dogs, but fine, you know. Um, <coughs> so they chose aardvark and blue whale first, and that got them into the aardvark blue whale group. They could have just as easily chosen blue whale aardvark. Would have done the same thing. So that's another path to get them into the same group. Um, and there's two factorial ways that we're looking at here, right? They could order the first two choices in, you know, all the ways there are permutations of the two things. But they could also irrelevantly, but also choose the last three things in any order they wanted. So there's three factorial more ways to do that. So we've got the number chosen factorial times the number not chosen factorial. And that's going to give us our group size, which is 12. But this is the way it was explained to me in my undergrad at first, like at a glance. And I thought, uh, this is not the simplest way to think about it, I think. Uh, it's actually like the number of walks down a decision tree is really a, an easier way, I think, to conceptualize. So let's take a look at that tree uh, to really like cement that concept in. So we've got a student who has made no decisions yet at all. And they're going to, this is one of the students, we're saying by definition, who gets into the aardvark blue whale group. So they have two ways to choose those two animals. And then, say they choose aardvark blue whale, they have six ways to choose the rest of the three animals. So they just, you know, permute A, B stick that in the front, and then permute CDE, stick that on the back. So all the ways to choose, so the number of ways to permute AB times the number of ways to permute CDE is the number of paths into the aardvark blue whale group. So what does this result give us? It gives us, we had 120 students, we had a group size of 12, we got 10 groups. And remember under the hood, we're not talking about the group size of students or anything, we're talking about the way to choose um, some things uh, out of some other things. And these numbers, like not, none of the logic we used at all is contingent on like the number three being involved or something like that. So we have our group size or um, the number of things, the number of like paths to our choice of certain things is always going to be the number of chosen things that we have, factorial, uh, times the number of not chosen things that we have, factorial. So given any set of n things, choosing k things from them, we've got this formula, which is really just that ratio that we used before. And the thing at the end, for those of you who are not familiar with it, the, the big parentheses, that's just the mathematical um, notation that people use for expressing the formula just before it. So <coughs> anyway, how is, how is this kindergarten class at all applicable to anything? Well, uh, you, you might use this kind of logic to decide on how to implement a cache. Uh, let's say the cache, hypothetically speaking, was just, you know, some server responses and the requests involved user choices. So you want to know how big the cache is. You know how, bar how large a cache you can tolerate. You know how large the server responses are individually. You want to know how many possible responses might end up in that cache. Well, you can count the user, you can count the number of uh, combinations of things the user can choose, and maybe or maybe not, you have to implement stuff to limit the size of that cache. Because, you know, it's not about solving, <coughs> it's not about solving the problem of limiting the size of the cache. Uh, anyone in this room could do that. It's whether or not you have to, and use your time efficiently. And so in a very similar way, this could help you decide how you might implement a parallelization of tasks. Sorry. Um, this is also useful logic for cartography, communication networks, languages both natural and computer. Um, tons of probability stuff. I'll give you an example of something that seems uh, sort of out of reach to compute, but is actually just exactly what we just talked about, actually 
pretty simple. So say you had, and again, you know, it's not just coins and heads and tails, but it will, it will be a coin example. Say you had 100 coins, and you want to know the probability that exactly, if flipped all at once, 13 of them turn up heads. Well, it seems like, well, how do I do that? You can actually do it on paper pretty easily. The number of ways, you, it, this probability is just the number of ways to get a success over the number of things that could happen. The number of things that could happen is two to the 100, right? You've got 100 coins. They could all end up heads or tails. They've got two different options each. The number of uh, ways to get a success is just 100 things, choose 13 of them, right? So all the different ways that you could choose 13 things out of 100. So this formula over 2 to the 100, where n is 100 and k is 13, is your probability right there. And then there's this litany of other things and uh, a reference as well. If anyone's uh, interested in learning more about how this logic is like a jumping off point to these different fields, then let me know and I'll, I'll send you that. Does anyone have any questions? That's, that's my talk, by the way. Um, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.